thank you, Marco, for inviting us, and thank you for staying it is, uh, here until the last uh, uh, speech or commentary. My name is Marita Mukkonen, and I'm co-founder of a collective called Perpetuum Mobile with Ivor Stodowski, who is next to me. And we often work it's, it's on transdisciplinary manner, it's, it's uh, on multi-year projects with uh, activists, with researchers, with uh, artists, with creators, art workers generally. Uh, I will say a few words uh, about uh, Checkpoint Helsinki. Andrew earlier presented something called Next Helsinki, which is a collaboration with an institution, which is an institution now called Checkpoint Helsinki, but it started as a movement in Helsinki, as an anti-Kuckenheim movement. There's a still plan, unfortunately, to build Kuckenheim Museum in Helsinki, and the core problem is that at uh, Kuckenheim wants Helsinki City pretty much to fully fund Kuckenheim. And uh, since also in the north, especially in Finland, we are facing uh, the economical reality that it is like uh, not only arts and cultural sector, but welfare state is being cut and is being radically cut, which means that there are more and more poor people it says less and less resources uh, generally it is uh, from the public sector. Uh, the proposal to build Kuckenheim with uh, public funding in this situation actually managed to mobilize intellectuals and art workers in Finland, which is not so common because it's, it's, it's like a consensus culture there really often. So actually it created it's a positive uh, momentum for people to come together and at the beginning there were assemblies, uh, uh, there were 100 to 150 people gathering together and starting to think what is the strategy actually to question Guggenheim. So before really going to public there was this background work to really think that is what is the proposal we will come up with. And we established several chambers and uh, we started to think about the proposal and, and uh, then finally, it is uh, after, I think it took two years, we managed to lobby and, and get funding from Helsinki City to start something called Checkpoint Helsinki. And one of the uh, main or core points of Checkpoint Helsinki is the fact that you don't need more walls, actually, when you work as an artist, a council worker. The problem we face is that there's never money for salaries, there's never money for productions, that we can find its spaces, there's plenty of spaces, we have public space, we have empty houses, and, and so on. And one of the core principles of Checkpoint Helsinki is that whenever it works with arts and cultural workers, is that, that it pays people from the proposal. So all the artists, it's basically, who work with Checkpoint Helsinki, are paid also, creators are paid, because it's in, in, in Finland often also art institutions, they don't pay independent creators. So I'm not going to explain more about Checkpoint Helsinki, but it relates also uh, to Perpetuum Mobile and what Ivor will shortly present. One of the first is a bigger process is Checkpoint Helsinki commissioned. is based on our uh, multi-year project called Realiant Art, which is still continuing. And, and then uh, we will say a few words or proposal. It is uh, related to Realiant Art since uh, we have launched a program, a uh, safe haven actually for cultural workers at risk. Because unfortunately many of the artists and, and uh, art and cultural workers we work with who really take political positions today have to flee their countries very quickly. So actually we are working on establishing a network of art institutions and residencies who can, it's very fast, come up with these artistic visa invitations and get people out of their countries. And that is already functioning, it is uh, in Helsinki, it's temporary, but uh, we have worked with uh, artists who are part of Reliant project. The first one was somebody called Rami Sam, who was the leading singer of Tahir Square, and uh, he hadn't uh, served his military service. And basically, uh, we had to get him out of the country very fast. 
and so we invited Rami to uh, play the opening kick of Reliant Art and that way we got him out of Egypt. He had tried earlier, he had failed, but when he received this invitation, he got through the uh, customs and now he's in Sweden. And after that we have also hosted somebody from Syria, somebody from Kiev and so on. So this is also something we are building up that if, if you have any kind of it is institutions who have resources to join such a network, that's a more international it's a network we want to build on a long term basis. But Ivor will say a few words about Realigned Art before basically it's, uh, we can wrap, wrap this session up. Thanks a lot, Marita. So this is, I mean, it's one more example from, from this list of, of different artists that were, you know, really in risk of, you know, losing their lives or not being able to participate in events, which is much less of a, you know, existential threat. But one of them, I think we should mention, is also Khaled Jarrah from Palestine, who, who wasn't led to, to New York, and when he actually wasn't led to, to come to our show in Helsinki, uh, th this was uh, To The Square 2, which Marita mentioned as one of the main projects. Uh, of the of Checkpoint Helsinki, you know, we basically put so much pressure on them through, actually through ministries even, that they just didn't dare to say, no, 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 you know, you have to stay there in, in, your, in your town, you know, and can't cross the border to Jordan to take the airplane to Helsinki. And so it's kind of finding these solidarity networks that put pressure on the right points to make sure that those governments are being watched that might kill the artist or the curator or the thinker, the musician, as Marita said, Rami has some. Um, we just actually hosted somebody from Morocco, a very young uh, hip hop artist who was uh, basically tortured and, and put in prison several times by the military for having criticized the monarchy there. You know, these people need places to go. So that's a form of real solidarity that we in the rich world, you know, can offer some way or another. It's, it's not as, as, you know, glorious sometimes, but it's, and it's just one person out of millions, but we can do something, at least in our field. And so, but to kind of, uh, I don't know if this is going to make a lot of sense in the, in the whole context, but what I would like to try to understand again is, is, is um, what stage we're in historically. Because maybe this is just as a final kind of like uh, presentation, maybe I can go back a bit and say what's amazing about what unites all of us that are given presentations is we're all kind of children of 2011 in a way. You know, we all kind of came here or are here somehow together because we were part of Occupy or we were part of... Uh, you know, the indignados or somehow did something that, that united us. So what I'm trying to do is, is think of 2011 or this era as a kind of another 1968, as a 1848, as a real revolutionary era that we're now in the aftermath of. And I think this would be like something to start conceptualizing for us. And, and, and through that, not saying, oh, it's another struggle, another little moment, another thing we have to fight and then look back at history and say, well, come on, we're just, you know doing the same thing we've always been doing. But this is the real moment that we can really grasp, I think. And, and it's right now that we have to really push, otherwise we're just gonna go down. And, and capital is much, much stronger than we are. And, and what, I, what I was trying to understand in, in getting here is to, to see why, why, why did this happen now? It's because I think that people realize that they're not only fighting like one thing, they're fighting two things at least, two mainstreams. So if we look at Russia, they're fighting Putin, but they're also fighting, you know, oligarchical capitalism at the same time. If you look at Egypt, which you've worked at, they're fighting Mubarak, right? And they overthrew Mubarak. And who came along? Morsi came along, a re you know, religious fundamentalist. So they're fighting at least two mainstreams. And so this is where the idea of realignment came from. We said, no, we're, we're non-aligned to this mainstream, non-aligned to that mainstream. If you know the history of the non-aligned movement in Yugoslavia and Egypt and, and in India and so on. But we're realigned to a new generation somehow. This is, this is what we're trying to kind of conceptualize. And so we, we, we've now kind of come out with a little newspaper and we're hoping to do another one in Kiev. This is called The Square and the way we work is we, we actually want to have artists and, and thinkers and philosophers, all kinds of people, not just artists, that um, actually personally took part in those uprisings. You know, not just talk about it, not just make an abstract work that somehow maybe talks about ecology or something, you know. But somebody who's actually on the forefront of it and, you know, puts their neck on the block and, you know, puts their life on the line for, for, for the movement in some way or another. And so there's a lot of those people, including, I don't know, I'll just read you from the newspaper. I mean, there's Nadia Tolokonikova, there's, you know, from the Pussy Riot Gang, 
There's uh, Ganzir, there's uh, Vlad Gerimic from Serbia, there's Federico Geller from Argentina, and there's like the whole lot. And I mean, I'm, we can go on, on, on and on, and it's not about just the capital of those names. It's about saying they come together because they have similar positions, and that's, that's amazing. I think that's pretty amazing that we all have this kind of similar positions in this time and place, so I'd, I'd like to end on that.